Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In the first of a pair of podcasts to mark the centenary of the armistice signed on the 11th of November 1918, we hear from Jenny Waldman, director of 1418 Now. I'm Jenny Waldman. I'm director of 1418 Now, which is the UK's arts programme for the First World War centenary. We were set up at the beginning with a very long title, which was the First World War Centenary Cultural Programme. We changed that to 1418 Now, partly because it trips off the tongue a little better, but also because we made a decision right at the beginning that we were going to commission new works of art by contemporary artists who speak to an audience today. We were given a particular brief, which was to reach a broader demographic than would otherwise immediately see themselves as part of an interested group in the centenary programme. We looked particularly at the cultural diversity and at the young people in the UK The artists of a hundred years ago, many of whom served in the First World War, had a profound impact on our perceptions of the First World War. Many of us learn about the First World War through the poetry, through the paintings. And now, a hundred years later, we felt it was time for contemporary artists to reflect on the events of a hundred years ago, to use the transformative power of the arts to bring the stories of the First World War to life for a generation who may not even remember a grandparent who had served in the First World War and to show how this global conflict still resonates in our world today. So we've been working with artists from around the world and across a range of art forms, with arts and heritage organisations all around the UK, to commission works that have been seen in Stornoway to Newcastle to Cornwall from Ipswich to Derry, Londonderry. One of the things that has surprised us most, um, we're absolutely thrilled, is the level of public interest in the First World War. When we started, we were asked what our ambitions for the programme were in terms of how many people we would engage across the UK. We took a big gulp and said, we want to reach 10 million people across the four and a half years of the First World War centenary. In our first year, we reached 16 and a half million. And to date, we have reached 30 million people across the UK. We have commissioned projects across all art forms, operas and plays, poetry and photography. But one of the things that I think is quite particular to 1418 now and to the time that we're living in is a strand of commissions that we started in 2014, which is to give artists the chance to create projects that are large scale, outdoors, in public spaces, that are free and participative or a combination of all of those. These innovative, large-scale, ambitious projects have engaged new audiences in new ways. The poppies in the Tower of London, strong red ceramic poppies, each representing a British and Commonwealth life lost in the First World War. We found two extraordinary philanthropists who bought and gifted to the nation several thousand poppies between them. These formed the two central sculptures of the poppies installation and were called Wave and Weeping Window. We have toured those sculptures to 18 outdoor locations around the UK. It'll be 19 by the end of the centenary. So far, about Four million people have seen the poppies around the UK on this tour. They have an extraordinary magic everywhere they go. A very intergenerational conversation takes place with people looking at them, talking to grandchildren, nieces and nephews about the First World War, about death, about all sorts of very personal reflections that they have about their family relationship to the war. Other outdoor large-scale works have included a piece that we did on the first day of the Battle of the Somme centenary in July of 2016. The piece by Jeremy Della, the artist, it was called We're Here Because We're Here. What took place was a surprise to everyone, apart from those few of us involved with it. 
2,000 volunteers dressed in entirely accurate First World War uniform appeared on the streets of the UK in shopping centres, in railway stations, in bus shelters, halfway up Mount Snowdon, in all sorts of places. People were confronted by a silent soldier simply standing there. If you asked them a question or looked at them, they would not speak. But each of our volunteers would hand you a card from their top pocket. And that card would give the name, rank and regiment and date of birth and date of death of a soldier who died 1st of July 1916. Around about 2 million people in all saw the soldiers because they were in very public spaces all day for eight hours. People wept, people hugged the soldiers, people wrote little messages on the back of the card and handed it back. One said, my great uncle died on the 5th of July, 1916, in the Battle of the Somme. It caused an extraordinary emotional outpouring that we hadn't entirely expected. It also went on social media. There was a little hashtag shared by everyone who got a card and took photographs of the soldiers. So by the end of the weekend, nearly 30 million people were aware of the soldiers. This was an example of an artist who didn't use social media himself, had observed that when people see something that's of interest, they immediately take a photograph or send a message to someone about it or put it on Twitter or Facebook. So the reach of this project was encouraged hugely by action on social media as well as reporting on television news and so on. What was interesting about all of that is that the response by people to even seeing it on television was also a very emotional response, that it really resonated within the country. Those are two examples of projects that are a very modern memorial. It came to you in your street, in your daily life. It surprised you. It made you think. And that is one of the things that a great artist can do. It didn't tell you what to think. And that's also a very important aspect of the Arts Commission's programme. One of the things that we found from the evaluation of the project is that people wanted to find out more about their own family connection to the First World War, more about what happened on the Somme. They wanted to find out more in general. It's been a fascinating journey for us with these different artists having completely different approaches to the subject and to what they want to talk about. So here we are now in 2018. We're, of course, obsessing about what the legacy of the 1418 Now programme will be. We have over 100 artworks which will continue to exist in some shape or form. There is only one statue, and that's the statue of Millicent Fawcett in Parliament Square, the only woman in Parliament Square. We've rather deliberately avoided creating more bronze memorials in that sense. But there are works of art that have gone into museum collections. There are operas, ballets and films that will continue to be seen and shown. Our own archive goes to the Imperial War Museum. We hope that people will continue to enjoy and appreciate the works that we've commissioned and that they will continue to resonate in the future, both in this country and around the world. That was Jenny Waldman, director of 1418 Now. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from novelist Sebastian Folkes, author of Birdsong.